I would now like the panel session to start. This panel session is essentially going to discuss the policy, uh, the regulation, the implementation, and the technologies involved. So from the policy side of view, uh, I'd like to welcome Matt Fudge uh, to give this presentation. Thank you, Robier. My name is Matt Fudge. I am the Utilities Program Manager at the Governor's Energy Office, and this will be uh, as many slides as I have, I'm going to burn through most of these pretty quickly because I think we want to get to the things that, um, the punchline at the very end. But I wanted to make one real brief, up brief comment, which was um, I heard from one of the people in the Ministry of Power talk about how um, transmission was something that they felt pretty confident in terms of build out and, and capacity. It was the distribution side that they were worried about. Um, I'd like to say I wish we had that problem. Um, we, we, uh, transmission is a little bit more difficult in this country and in this state in particular. Uh, the distribution system is finally managed and developed by the utilities. Thank you very much. So um, if you guys can help us, then maybe we can help you. So with that said, uh, it's a little more complicated than that. Um, so I'm going to go through these presentation topics very quickly. Uh, I just want to talk a little bit about some of the projects that are occurring on the smart grid side in the state of Colorado, what the regulatory environment looks like in the state. Um, it's different, of course, from, from the state of India. Uh, and some general observations about those market conditions. Uh, there was a bill that we put together in the legislature last year. This goes to the policy, which was essentially to put a bunch of smart people in the room, smarter than the government people, and talk about uh, how we might move forward with smart grid deployment. How did those, uh, what was the outcome for that experiment? Uh, and then a little bit about reconfiguring the system, a little bit about what our policy goals are, what the barriers are, and a little bit about utility business models, which of course is what you guys want to talk about. Um, here are two projects. They are not the only two projects in the state of Colorado. There are more than this, so I don't want to um, skip those for, for uh, any reason of, of stating they're not important, but they just happen to be some of the more high profile projects in the state. Randy here will be able to talk a lot more about what Excel has done in Boulder. But uh, essentially, that project is in its uh, last phase. So correct me if I'm wrong, Randy, but you guys are pretty much almost complete. And you're wrapping up a both a pricing uh, component, which is to deliver time to use pricing, different range of prices, signals to the customer. Also, some in-home devices to allow for demand response and experiment on that side. Um, they received a CPCN, which just basically means they got approval for uh, the cost recovery of that project. There was some. Uh, discussion of issues at the commission about that, and that's some of the things I think you guys would be interested in talking about later on. I'm not going to get into that now, but the pricing pilot has been approved. There's a business model and system architecture discussion as a result of that project. Excel went, um, as far as we're concerned, far ahead of a lot of the other utilities in, in kind of developing a very robust architecture. And as a result of that, we've learned a lot about some of the things that we can do and some of the things we might want to do differently, but I think it's better for Randy to talk about that. Uh, in Fort Collins, uh, we have a project which basically is a lot more about microgridding, and I, there's some people here in the audience that could talk more about that project, but the bottom line is trying to figure out how do you tie in multiple distributed generation, renewable distributed generation resources in a dispatchable way. So uh, I thought that would be interesting for the comments that you made about rural electrification and how do you microgrid and get something off the grid on distributed. That's a very complicated engineering feat to do that. Um, here's some of the other projects. We had an AMI expansion in, uh, down in the south uh, in Pueblo, Colorado, which is a little further south than here. Um, the DOE, which is the Department of Energy, the U.S. Department of Energy, gave them some funding to basically do a very significant AMI deployment there. Um, there's another AMI expansion that has been done by Clear Valley Rural Electric, and I think Jim Swires here can speak a little more to that project. But the, the bottom line is that there's different utilities around the state that have been trying to do different things for different reasons to serve their territory's different needs. I think that's a summary of the situation in the state. Um, so a little bit about the regulatory environment. Um, we're what I call a bifurcated market. So basically all that means is that we have a regulated sector that's regulated by the Public Utilities Commission, which Commissioner Baker will talk more about. And then we have a sector of the state that is not regulated by the commission. Uh, those are the rural electric cooperatives and also the municipal utilities. So they operate under their own governmental control. Um, and so those are the non-investor utilities. So as a result of that, it means that we have, from a policy standpoint, a statewide government perspective, 
uh, it means we have a, a different kind of environment. But ultimately, you have a lot of bilateral trade, a lot of uh, power purchase agreements that really dictate how supply and demand are determined. You have two balancing authorities, and then you have two very different looking markets from an operating perspective and from a regulatory perspective. So the complexity from a policy making standpoint is how do we, be, how do we achieve the, the policy ends from a government perspective working with two very different kinds of markets and achieving the same ends? So that's the challenge from, from the state government perspective. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about smart grid planning, what has been done specifically in smart grid in the state up to this point. Um, there are a lot of projects that have been funded by the Department of Energy and also from utility um, uh, rate payers in the state. And I think that they've had uh, pretty good results overall. We're seeing a lot of different kinds of uh, mutual benefits that are coming from them. Um, one of the challenges, and I'm listing some of the challenges up here on this slide, um, is that every utility has their own particular uh, needs in their service territory, and they're different from maybe what another utility needs. Um, as a result of this, we have uh, a lot of different kinds of value propositions being thrown at the consumer. So from the customer perspective, people who are actually purchasing this power and using it, um, it's hard for them to decipher exactly why we're investing in this because you have maybe 30 different ways of, of doing it. And so that's a complication for the consumer side and that's something we need to work on better. Um, currently, I would say the projects are very power systems engineering and utility centric. There are also a lot of uh, projects that are also consumer based, but they're spread across the, the board. There's a healthy tension between the power industry uh, and the vendors. Um, so the vendors want to be able to come into the space and develop innovative products. But ultimately, the, the utility needs to have a very reliable source of power, and they need to be able to do it and know that these systems are going to work. That creates tension between the communities. That's a healthy tension, and I think it's good for the industry, but it doesn't necessarily mean that the consumer gets the benefit very quickly. So how do we resolve that? That's another uh, challenge we have. Finally, government industry must offer a vision about why are we doing this. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about that. So we, what do we do? We said, well, okay, it's a little complicated. These investments aren't really strategic. Um, it's not easy to articulate why we need to invest in this technology for consumers, so why don't we get an 11-member task force of people who are really smart to debate about why, what we should do and why are we doing it. Um, this bill was signed by Governor Ritter, our former governor. We now have Governor Hickenlooper, who is uh, adopting some of this policy, and we'll figure out what we're going to do forward. But the bottom line is it's said bipartisan po uh, sponsorship, and we had the commission helping us as well. So um, the reflection of this is that there are, there's, a con there's a consortium of interest from a policymaking community, from the electric power community, from the regulator, and from the non-regulated utilities to move forward, but do it in a healthy and stable way. And that was what this, this exercise was about. Who was made up of this task force? I'm sure this will be familiar to the Indian, uh, Indian delegation. You have the three utility classes, the investor in utilities, the rural electric utilities, and the municipal utilities. You had uh, a group con uh, representing consumer protection environmental issues. You had commercial developers. You had energy policy and regulation. And of course, you had the director of the energy office. What was our purpose? Our purpose was to identify what are the different pathways to moving forward on investment. So um, a quick and dirty way of summarizing what we came up with was you can either do this, this being investment in smart grid architecture and investment, um, either in a slow and steady state, so where you do a pilot, you figure out what the value proposition is, you move to another pilot, you figure out what the value proposition is. That's sort of the slow and steady and stable way of dealing with it. You can do a medium aggregate kind of faster way, which is to be a little bit more risky. That means you have to change some business rules around that. Or you can be very aggressive and visionary, which requires a high amount of risk, and somebody has to take that risk. The question is, who's going to take that risk? That's one thing we didn't completely resolve. Um, we submitted this plan to the, the legislature on January 20th of 2011. Bottom line is it's a set of recommendations outlining how consumers and utilities can cooperatively build a new relationship. Now, what I mean by that is this is this business model question that we all have. Um, in order to really get end-to-end -end from all the way inside of the consumer's home on the distributed generation side, all the way to the network operations center, and getting the utility to gain the benefit of these deployments and cost recovery, but the consumer to be able to engage with this in energy in a different way, that's going to require a different sort of relationship between all these parties. Um, so that's some of what we talked about when we offered some recommendations to the legislature, to the commission, and also to the utilities about how to move in that direction. I'm not going to go through all the recommendations that are in this plan, so I'm going to skip that. But what I would say right now is that the overarching view of the administration on smart grid is the following, which is we want to accelerate and invest technologies that allow us to innovate a higher percentage of renewable energy because we are focused on that, implementing the 30% renewable energy standard. 
We want to focus on technologies that reduce the emissions profile, particularly carbon and sulfur and, and nitrous, oxide, nitrous oxide. We want to account for and provide regulatory certainty for investments on the regulated side and improve grid reliability. We want to provide funding and expand the academic capacity for new workforce, which is a huge issue, which is we don't have enough engineers to be able to build the system. And we want to promote energy conservation first.